viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. As we continue our journey in the book of Revelation, as we open up today's session, let's dedicate this moment to God in prayer. Father, we we love you. We are humbled at your grace. We are humbled by the love with which you have for us. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for entrusting us with the word of God. That through it we might know you. To know your heart for mankind. And through us your spirit might work to fulfill your plans and purposes. To redeem man back to God. And for that we are grateful. Yes, Lord. Have your way, Lord. Yes. Reign through us. Yes. That we might bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 In the previous two chapters, we outlined characteristics and ministries of two important persons. That will take center stage in the end time. And this came through in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation. But prior to that, we saw the rise of the enforcer. Who is the dragon who we identified as Satan? And then in chapter 13, it is here that we saw two persons, two men. One coming out of the sea, whom we identified as the Antichrist. And then we saw another coming up out of the earth. And it is this one that we identified as the false prophet. Against that background, we saw a lot of chaos breaking out. We saw destruction happen. We saw saints being persecuted. And against this, this background, the next chapter then unfolds before us, which we shall be reading today. And our reading will be taken from the book of Revelation chapter 14 from verse 1 to 5. The Bible says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like, a, like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as it were a new song before the throne. Before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. 
Okuja koba ne mitwa lukumi nena mungu minya abaguli wokuva monsi. These are the ones who are not defied with women. Beba na abate yonu na nabakazi. For they are virgins. Wanga tebama nyabakazi. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. From this text, having seen the second beast that arose from the earth, the Bible described him to us as having a, a lamp like feature and with horns and against this cushion we now have John look up and he now sees a lamb standing on Mount Zion. So a number of contrasts come up when you look at chapter 14 and chapter 13. The, in chapter 13, we saw a lamb-like feature. Now we see a lamb standing on Mount Zion. We see an ascension. We saw the first beast arising out of the sea. We saw the second beast arising out of the earth. Now we see the lamb and the 144,000 standing on Mount Zion. In chapter 13, we saw that the followers of the beast had a mark on their foreheads and on their right hand with the number 666. Now we see the followers of the Lamb having the names of the Son and the Father upon them. We see that the beast's structure or system was full of spiritual corruption and little halotary. But when we look at the followers of the Lamb, we observe a system of purity and truth. We saw the beast system as an enslaving one. It was filled with persecution, with murder. But we see the lamb's approach as a different one. His approach is to ransom men from the earth and from men. His approach is to redeem. His approach is to set free. Now, having understood that, the next question that comes to mind is with regard to the 144,000 that are standing with him. But I want you to say something about where he is standing. Before we get into the 144,000, we saw the dragon who is Satan in the previous chapter standing on the sand of the seashore. Now we see the lamb standing on Mount Zion. One points to stability. 
The other is on a, a surface that is quick to change structure. This points to the permanence of the victory that will be attained. Because while the dragon was standing on the side, that speaks of something that is temporary. When we see the lamb, he is going to be standing on Mount Zion, which speaks of triumph. The point I want to drive home to you watching and listening, is that in the end Jesus wins. So it doesn't matter how it all looks like right now. It doesn't matter how long it may take. In the end, the victory belongs to Jesus. So why is the Lamb standing? In the New Testament, there are two scenarios before this one where we see Jesus standing. The first account we have is in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. This is where we have the account of the martyrdom of Stephen. And in the 56th chapter, when Stephen lifts up his eyes, he gives us the account that he sees Jesus standing. The second account we have, where we see the lamb stand, is in the book of Revelation chapter 5. Verse 7 gives us an account where they were on the lookout for someone who was worthy to break the seals of the scroll. Then the lamb stood and broke the seals of the scroll. Now the first instance was an instance of honoring those who had run the rest well. It was an instance of rewarding those who had fought a good fight. It was an instance of rewarding those who had kept the faith. In the second instance, we see him now rising in judgment. And I believe the account that we just saw, he is standing to execute both accounts. To reward the 144,000 with honor and also to pass judgment. Now, having understood that, we then take a look at who the 144,000 are. I remember some time back, I met somebody who, was, who had come preaching from the Jehovah Witness sect. And he looked very convincing trying to explain to me that he was one, one of the 144,000. And we had to take it all the way back to Revelation chapter 7 because that is where we first have the first mention of the 144,000. And the Bible details that these come out of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we see 12,000 
coming out of each tribe. With the exception of one tribe, which I explained when we handled this text. So I asked him, which of these tribes do you come from? And when we went to chapter 14 and looked at what characterizes these witnesses, he discovered that he was not one of them. But for purposes of our text and our study this evening, I want us to go back to Revelation chapter 7. Because this is not one person. These are quite a number of people. This is a group of men who love and serve the Lord in the worst of times. And it is in these times that we see them stand. And the question we ask ourselves, how were they able to stand? Or how will they be able to stand in such trying times? This is what the Bible tells us. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3, there was a cry to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea saying do not harm the earth the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And we see in chapter 14 that they were sealed with the name of the Lord Jesus and of his Father God. Now I want us to draw a parallel from here. You see, everyone that comes to the Lord Jesus, the Bible tells us that they are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit that marks us as separate from the world as the redeemed of the Lord. No, no wonder the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 9 the second section it says if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ he is not his. So the distinguishing character that any believer in Jesus Christ should have is the spirit of Christ. For he goes further in verse 14 to tell us that for as many as are led by the spirit of God these are the sons of God. Verse 16 he emphasizes the point and says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Paul in another portion of scripture Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 cautions us not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God and he gives us the reason he says by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption so here we see the 144,000 and the reason they are protected in this time of evil 
is because they have been sealed on their foreheads. They have been sealed by God. And they are sealed for a purpose. They are not sealed just to show off. They are sealed to accomplish God's purpose in that time. And in verse 9, the Bible continues to explain what was happening. And John reveals to us the impact of their ministry. He said, after these I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white with palm branches in their hands. Now, you may ask, who are these? Because the same questions was asked. And this was the elder's response to John. John records, I say to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. I want you to consider the time they come up. They are coming out of a great tribulation. They are coming out of a time that is not pretty, that is not comfortable. It is tough. But even in that time, God's grace will be there to save as many as will come to him. But why does God anction these to preach the gospel. And this should be the caution to you and I that have received Jesus Christ. You see, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have a message. Or let me put it this way. We are stewards of the only message on planet earth that can give people what their hearts need. And this is hope. Hope for what? Hope that sins can be forgiven. Hope that prayer can be answered. Hope that doors that had been previously shut can be opened. Hope that broken relationships. I mean relationships between men and men. And relationships between men and God can be repaired. And reconciliation can come into a reality. Hope that the disease can be healed. Hope that damaged trust can be restored. Hope that the resurrection the resurrection can happen to death. This hope only comes about through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nowhere else on the face of this earth is there hope that the dead can rise. Nowhere on the face of this earth is there hope that you can gain life now that will take you through all eternity. So for whoever has believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a messenger 
mutume wasubi and it is owed to you era chikugwanira to take this message of hope twalo bubaka buno obulete su to the ends of the earth beginning with the locality where you are tandikire yo josula back to the text that we read for many people when they look at this text it comes to them in a symbolic nature yes i understand that the book of revelation has so many symbolisms but as much as it has symbolism it does also have plain speech and therefore we need to look at what it is implying and be able to determine what the event is about because when we look at the accounts of the bible especially in the book of revelation many of these accounts will actually take place so often when we come to a text like this and the bible talks about mount zion the question many ask is this a literal Jesus standing in Mount Zion in Israel. Yes, mwene ajja kujja imirire ku rusozi rwa Zion mu Israel. All is this Jesus standing with the redeemed in Mount Zion that we see in Hebrews chapter 12. Oba Yesu nga emirira ne bano bayagula mu rusozi rwa Zion oluli mu mu Bebulani esura ya 10 na yo kubiri. The truth of the matter is the Bible is silent on whether it is on earth or in heaven that this is happening. But, and where the Bible is silent, wisdom dictates that you maintain that silence and focus on what the message is that the Bible wants you to carry on. Here we see a number of things coming through. We see a people who have been sealed by God. And I want us to look at what characterizes these people. Number one, these are people that are characterized by being unworthy. In other words, they don't consider the world as their eternal home. They consider the world as their eternal home. The Bible defines these men and says they were redeemed from among men being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. They have been separated. In other words, the word redeemed is comes from a Greek word agora which means marketplace. It is like you going to a marketplace and buy something to take home. When you purchase it from the marketplace and take it, it is yours. It belongs to you. So one of the things that we saw is that they are sealed and the father's name and the name of our Lord Jesus is written on their foreheads. Now it may not make a lot of sense to you in this era but I would want you to look at it from a point of being a brand. You see, brands are very important within the corporate world or market that we live in. Now, I want you to add the two. When you buy something from the market, 
It belongs to you. Now, what many people do when they buy something and they want anyone to note that it is theirs, they place a sign on it, a mark that distinguishes it as their own. It, it is like if you want to buy a shirt and I want to buy a shirt and you decide that at the back of the shirt you will place your name. So whoever finds this identifies it as yours. On the other hand, if they found mine which I did not place any mark, it cannot be distinguished from that which is in the market. So it can easily be mixed with what is in the market. So the marking separates it from what it was before. It distinguishes it as belonging to someone. So when you are redeemed, God places a mark of ownership upon you. So if you are not saved, you are still in the marketplace. It is Jesus who purchases you from the market. And sees you with the Holy Spirit. That is when you are marked out as redeemed for men. As redeemed from the world. And I want you to understand that when you are redeemed, he has bought you with no intention of selling you to another bidder. You say, I can go to the market, purchase something, and along the way, if I met someone, he says, I would like to have that. Many times, I would, if they offer a higher price, I may be tempted to sell it to them so that I get a profit. But when we see this word redemption coming through, it talks about with respect to salvation. It talks about being bought with no intention of ever putting you up for sale, no matter the price. And that should be exciting for you. Because Christ has redeemed us with no intention of ever putting us up for sale. The point I want you to understand, my brother, my sister, or anyone watching, you are not for sale. That's why the Bible says you are not your own. You are bought with a price. And it goes on to say, therefore glorify God with your body. So you and I that have been bought by the blood of Jesus should not be swept away by the wise principles and their goals and ambitions. Those are not yours. Those belong to the world. Your focus should be on Christ. That is where you need to set your heart. That is where you need to set your mind. Why? Because now your life is hid in Christ. And it is hid in God. Take that and understand that. And it is against that background then that you are called to live a life 
of purity. Now the ownership bit of this mark that we talk about we need to understand it from the, those days. When somebody went to a market and bought a slave, they put their mark on this slave. So everywhere this slave went, they were identified as belonging to a certain person. Because this is the one that had bought them. And their mark rested on them. In the same way, if somebody bought an animal, a sheep or a cow, or a donkey or a camel, they had a signature, a brand that they did a branding on that animal. And that was the mark of ownership. And I told you before that the Holy Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you and I that believe in Jesus Christ. So it is not a religion. No, it is not an exercise. No, it is the Holy Spirit that marks you as a Christian, as a child of God. The second instance where marks were used was with soldiers. If a soldier belonged to a certain battalion, they often showed their loyalty to their generals by placing a mark or a brand of the general's name on their bodies. As an expression to whoever bothered to look at them that their allegiance was to this general. Now to us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ our loyalty should be to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now having understood that we then go to the next characteristic of these witnesses. The Bible tells us that they sang a new song. And there is a reason why they sing. And, the, and that should be the reason why you and I ought to sing. Because we have now, we now belong to God. We now belong to the Lamb and His Father. We have been separated from the evil ways. We have been separated from all the tyrants. So we are now living for Him. You see, we are living at a time. And often we forget our situation before Christ before Christ saved us because when you understand what Christ has done for you your life will be filled with wonder now that life of wonder is what causes us to exclaim it is what causes us to burst out in worship. It is what causes us to express our ways in ways that are considered crazy. 
It is what causes us to break out in dancing and in song. It is what causes us to clap our hands. To jump up and in ways that people say, What's wrong with these people? Ka, ka, can't, can't you be dignified a bit? That there is no dignity in this. Because where he got you, he got you out of nowhere. You had nothing of worth. You were a reject. Bound for hell for eternity. Filled with sin. And he washed you. Not for what you did. But it was an act of grace extended to you. You did not deserve it. But his mercy was extended to you. And it is that grace that is keeping you going every day of your life. It is that grace that teaches you to say no to sin. It is that grace that teaches you to overcome the evil one. How can you not maintain the wonder? of the one that loved you and gave his life up for you. You see, my brethren, my brothers and sisters, we should never lose the wonder of what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. You can lose anything. But never lose the wonder of what God has done for you in Christ Jesus. And they break up into a song. No wonder when Christians break up into song, it creates such an atmosphere that the presence of God is undeniable in their midst. I want us to say something more about these people. The Bible says concerning them that they are the ones who had never defied themselves with women. And for they were virgins. Now, for many people, this when they read this text, they developed this thinking that God prefers celibate lives or celibacy. As opposed to people getting married. Actually, when you go through church history, you will meet people like Oregon, who was one of the first, who was the first theologian in the church. And it is said that this guy castrated himself. It is believed that this guy castrated himself so that he can conform to this scripture. History has a, a, an account of a man called Makan who formed the church of only celibates. Now this is a misunderstanding of what this scripture is all about. Uh, when you read the Bible, in the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, and verse 2, Paul writes to the church, and he says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that to Christ, I may present you as a pure virgin. He is talking about a spiritual purity. Now you see, historically, when you read the Old Testament, 
you will discover that time and again the children of Israel rebelled against God and went into apostasy and worshipped other spirits and other gods. And God looked at that as halotry. So, that is the concept that is being pictured here. The other one that we need to understand is that many of these temples had prostitutes. So, worshippers would have sexual relations with these prostitutes as a way of worshipping. And that way they defy themselves. And that in itself was also a form of halotry. And listen to me, because we are in a time or in an age where pornography is all over the place, this is not without purpose, because this speaks to the end time. This brings you closer to where the devil wants us to get to. To the worship of sex. And it's not far away. Because when you read the media today, you get to see uh, instances of people creating nude charges and nude beaches and all over the place. And that is worrying. But it is not far-fetched. But even when it gets at its highest intensity, the Bible tells us that there will be men that will not defile themselves. That speaks to you and I. You see, when evil thrives, it is not a license for you and I to sin. When evil thrives, there needs to be a light shining out in the darkness. There needs to be a light that shines out so brightly when the evil gets so dark and so intense. Here we have an account of not one man but 144,000 witnesses. When the enemy had brought out his worst, they stood and defiled. No wonder we have this picture of the Lord Jesus standing on Mount Zion surrounded by 144 men with a testimony that when evil abounded we stood on purity we stood on truth I, I liken it to a musical show. Now, in I like orchestra. And often in orchestra, there is someone that is not playing an instrument. This one is the conductor. Now this man pray, 
plays or woman plays a very important role. Katono mama bo mchala akola akola echinde chikuru nyo. In how this music is going to be coordinated. He is the person who dictates the temple. He is the one who dictates who goes up and who goes down. At one point he may just call all the instruments to silence and only allow one instrument or two to come up. At certain instances, he calls all of them together. And the music is so lovely. When everyone is playing to the beat or to the tempo of the conductor. You see, our lives are dictated by reading. Everything that we do, our hearts, for example, beat according to a certain rhythm. And when they don't do that, then you have to go to a doctor to check what has happened to your rhythm. Your lungs breathe in and out following a certain rhythm. Your liver and kidneys also function following a certain rhythm. And that is how God has designed us. But I want you to see something else. This works for your body. But even in the spiritual, there is an unseen conductor who determines the temple. Who coordinates every movement and every part of your life to achieve a particular result? One such conductor is Jesus Christ. And I'm going to drive the point home. So, those that come to him. Are dictated, are dictated by the pace that he gives and run their lives according to what he desires. For these men, the Bible tells us that they are the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Now, first fruit is a metaphor that was used during the sacrificial times in the Old Testament. And they used to get during the barley harvest. The children of Israel would go out in the field and take a sheaf of the harvest. And they would wave this as an offering to God. They would get the best of the grain, the best of their crop, the best of their produce. And that is what they used to wave. To give thanks to God for this harvest. But also, the first fruit to them was the evidence that there was more to come. Now, we saw that in Revelation chapter 7 when we went down to verse 9 we saw the multitude that came to the Lord and this sinks in 
kati echo ochimala no chitege Paul writes to us in the book of Romans chapter 11 Chikwata ga necho Paul chayogera ko mbalumi 10 verse 26 to 27 where he speaks concerning the salvation of Israel ngayogera ku buloko zibwe gwanga lya Israel and he says just as it is written nabagamba ngawe chawandi the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So what does this mean to us? Today. We need to stop to ask ourselves in the lives that we are living right now we need to ask ourselves whose rhythm are we following if we are to break the cycle of our damaged lives the only way we do it is to change the rhythm of life and the only way to change the rhythm of life is to change the conductor this is the only way because it is the conductor that will change the way you act. You will change the way you think. You will change the way you live. And if it is not Jesus Christ, then it is the other person whom we saw as the dragon. The usurper. The devil or the tempter. So before you make any declaration, you need to ask yourself a question, so searching question. Who is the conductor of my life? Who is dictating the rhythm I am playing to? If it is not Jesus, today you can make him the Lord, the conductor of your life. And be in league of this great harvest whose first fruit is the 144,000. If you have never given your life to Jesus, This is the moment. Ask him into your life. Let me pray with you. God Almighty, Father of all creation, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. A sinner, unworthy to stand before you. I ask for your forgiveness. Lord, wash me with the blood. Cleanse and purify me. This day, I surrender my life to you, Jesus. And I invite you in my life as my Savior and personal Lord. I ask you, Lord, to be the conductor of my life by your Holy Spirit that I may walk this walk at the dictates of the temple that you have set. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Help me to live for you. For your glory, your honor, and your fame. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today you have been wonderfully saved. Your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Now you need to take the first steps. There is that number on the screen. Please call it. Tell us about your experience. And we will guide you on the first steps.
If not, go to the next Bible believing church next to you. Woba tosubula no nya kanisa yonekiriza mu Bible. Tell them that you have been wonderfully saved. Bategeze ndulukusi and ask them to guide you on the next steps. Basaiba kulunga me bakuyamba okutegera ekiddako. To you the believer. Weye no mukiriza. To you that is struggling. I talked to you earlier and said we have a message. A message of hope. And today, we are going to call on this God of hope to come through for your situation. Because this message of Christ is a message that brings life to dead situations. It is a message that turns situations around, that causes closed doors to open, that causes diseased bodies to get healed. Father, in the name of Jesus, you said it. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything to hide from me? King of glory. I thank you. Because you follow your word to perform it. Even now, Lord, we stand in agreement concerning that one that is diseased. Concerning that one that is sick today concerning that one that is believing you for a scholarship concerning that one that is believing for an opportunity be it a promotion at work be it an elevation in society be it a change of their circumstances and situations be it breaking a habit in the name of Jesus Christ the son of the living God we speak to every shackle. We speak to every confining spirit. We command it to lose its hold over your life in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the Living God. Father of glory and mercy, reveal your majesty and power in the lives of these, your people that out of their weeping situation a song of praise and triumph will arise that will bring honor, glory and fame to your name we thank you Lord because you do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask and we count it done in Jesus' name We believe God is doing marvelous things. And for you who is watching us, for you who has agreed with us in prayer, please call that number. Testify. Tell us what God is doing in your life. And let's bless the name of the Lord together. From Dominion Church. Till we meet again. Say shalom. God richly bless you. Amen.